pediatric gecko session of the year. Uh, gecko is uh, hosted by the Gastro Foundation in association with Project Echo from the University of New Mexico. We have these meetings every week on a Wednesday. And today we've received 28 registrations from six different African countries. Um, the chat will be open for questions or you can pose questions later. And uh, with that, I'm very happy to introduce Yolanda Montera, who hails from Tigerberg. Well, initially, I think hails from um, Mozambique, but currently in Tigerberg doing pediatric gastroenterology. And she's going to enlighten us on some of these vexing disorders that are difficult to diagnose and even more difficult to treat. And I look forward to some discussion at the end to see how we tackle these problems in a resource limited setting like South Africa. So over to you, Yolanda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Tim. So I'm uh, I'm going to present today, um, talk about the non-IG mediated gastrointestinal food allergy. So uh, first uh, we are going to uh, discuss a case uh, about a patient that we have uh, admitted to, to our ward here in Tigerbeck Hospital. So starting with the case, uh, we have a nine weeks old boy that was admitted to our ward Tagebeck Hospital from Referring Hospital. Uh, he presented, uh, he had a history of chronic diarrhea and vomiting with shock and metabolic acidosis for three weeks. So this is a baby that's uh, HIV unexposed, was born a term baby by C-section for fetal distress and had a birth weight uh, of 3.21 kgs. Uh, is the third child of non-consanguineous parents. His weight on admission to our, to our ward was 4.3 kgs. And um, the history was that uh, the patient started having diarrhea with lo loose non-bloody stools and vomiting after meals two weeks after starting standard infant formula at four weeks of age which means that uh, for the first, first month of, of life, it was only getting exclusive breast, uh, breastfeeding. Then uh, from four weeks, mom started giving a standard, standard infant formula. And after two weeks, after the, uh, the introduction of formula, he started having diarrhea and vomiting as well. So this uh, uh, baby was admitted to the referring hospital in uh, hypovolemic shock due to severe dehydration with metabolic acidosis, acute kidney injury, and hyponatremia. He required for fluid bolises, uh, also rise a for seizures and kefter son. And at that moment in the referring uh, hospital, they uh, stopped the formula and he was receiving only expressed breast milk. And uh, he continued, uh, um, even uh, even st even after stopping the formula, he continued having loose stools. And, and uh, now the stools, uh, at that moment, the stools became bloody and they increased to 20, uh, 20 stools a day. And also he had the HB uh, drops uh, that I think it was, uh, 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 if I'm not mistaken, 10 at the moment when he was admitted and it dropped to 5.9 and he required a blood transfusion because of that. Uh, then at that moment, uh, with the ongoing diarrhea, the breastfeeding was stopped and the baby was changed to, to extensively hydrolyzed formula. Uh, and also uh, they did the same viral load at that moment that was positive with a log of 5.8 and gancyclovir was commenced at that, at that moment. 
uh, there was no uh, clear improvements. Uh, the the stools they stopped being bloody, but it was continued. He continued having loose stools, and the baby was referred to TBH uh, GIT. Uh, Talking about the anthropometry, uh, when he was admitted to our ward, he had a weight of 4.3 kgs and the length of 20, 58 uh, centimeters. They had circumference of 10 to 39 centimeters, which was uh, which is normal for the age. And if uh, you can, let me try to. Yes. If you see here where the, is the um, red arrow, this is the moment when uh, mom uh, introduced form, uh, formula and he started having diarrhea. So he was growing, growing well until the moment that he, the formula was introduced and um, he started having diarrhea. So then he started losing weight and then he started crossing centiles and then he was underweight and eventually he became severe, severely malnourished with the ongoing uh, diarrhea. So uh, during uh, ad admission to, to our ward, he was still having diarrhea, loose stools, but they were no longer bloody. Uh, on arrival, he was still dehydrated with metabolic acidosis and hyponatremia. Uh, the baby was wasted. He was not dysmorphic. Uh, he had no eczema, only uh, had a transient macropapular skin rash, and there was no edema. Uh, the abdomen was distended, but there was no hepatosplenomegaly. Uh, he also required fluid boluses uh, in, uh, uh, in our ward, and he was changed to a different intensively hydrolyzed formula with no uh, imp improvement as well. Um, he was treated with uh, uh, antibiotics as well, uh, with peparacigin, tazobatan, and amikacin, and continued the treatment with vancansacovir for the CMV, probably CMV collided at that moment with a positive log and bloody stools. Uh, also, uh, there was a complaint from the mom that he had, uh, he wasn't moving uh, very well, his um, left, uh, left upper limb, and we did the uh, abdominal uh, sorry, we did the ultrasound that showed uh, thrombosis, deep vein thrombosis of the left internal jugular and started low molecular weight. Um, um, let's see. Um, heparin, yes, sorry. So our initial differential diagnosis uh, were, it, this could be a severe post-enteritis enteropathy. Uh, the baby had a long-standing diarrhea and uh, was uh, after two weeks, he was uh, continuing to have diarrhea. And if this was uh, acute infectious diarrhea and then he continues to have diarrhea, maybe this is a severe post-enteritis enteropathy. And also it could be a cow's milk protein allergy uh, in form of a food protein induced enteropolitis syndrome or a food protein induced enteropathy. Because uh, despite uh, being treated for the, the possible CMV colitis, the, the, the diarrhea didn't improve. And also uh, in the history, the baby only started having diarrhea after formula uh, introduction. So maybe this is uh, a cow's milk protein allergy. Also, it could be a primary immunodeficiency because uh, uh, these patients can be present with diarrhea. Uh, they can have um, infectious diarrhea like CMV, like uh, cryptosporidium. So this also could be a primary immunodeficiency. Or because the diarrhea started so early, uh, it could be also intractable diarrhea of infancy. Of infancy. So infectious, uh, less likely because even though he was treated for the he was treated for the CMV uh, colitis, also when he started having the uh, when he started he only started having diarrhea after the introduction of the standard uh, uh, infant formula, which is more in keeping with the uh, allergy and less like anatomical abnormalities. So going to the laboratory investigations that we uh, did, uh, the UNE uh, uh, showed the, the hyponatremia that um, already uh, I spoke about it. 
and he had uh, uh, the FBC he had a uh, HB of 12.8, blood list of 67, and white blood cells of 16.98. You think that this HB probably was dehydrated? It was probably hemoconcentration. And he had a total protein of 62, albumin of 32. The liver enzymes were normal. The HIV PCR was negative. We did a TB workup that was also negative. Uh, syphilis it was also negative. We also did the lymphocyte subsets and the immunoglobulins, thinking of a primary immunodeficiency, which were, was was normal. And uh, we did repeat the urine. Urine MCNS that was done also in the referring hospital, and it was uh, positive for Enterobacter se. So it was on antibiotics for that. Um, and the stool MCNS was mucored with numerous leukocytes, and there was um, the, the culture was negative. And also he had the reduced uh, stool reducing substances that was positive, three plus positive and the uh, fecal osmotic gap that was 53. Also the fecal sodium was was really high, uh, it was at 101. And at this moment, uh, we were uh, trying to uh, figure out if this was a osmotic diarrhea or secretory diarrhea, but it looked like it was mixed because even uh, we tried to put the, the patient NPO for a few days, uh, for, a, for, for, for one day to see if the stool's uh, output was going to improve but it did, it, it did not improve. And also he had a, a high fecal sodium on stool. So it looked like it was uh, more of a mixed, mixed, um, uh, mixed area, osmotic and uh, secretory. Uh, so we also did endoscopy because uh, the baby was uh, put on an extensive hydrolyzed formula and, and, and it wasn't improving and um, at this point, we are thinking maybe this is uh, intractable, intractable diarrhea of infancy or maybe one of those congenital diarrhea. So uh, we discussed and decided to do an endoscopy and to take um, bios biopsies of the small uh, intestine. So we did the biopsy. I don't know if you can see uh, in, the, in the imaging that there is a villus. Uh, the villi are really uh, blunted here in, in this patient. So I think it's it's possible to see, you can see here, this really uh, the uh, villi blunting. So the histology, which is the preliminary report, we're still um, uh, waiting for the formal report. It showed that the esophagus was normal and the stomach had the early atrophy, markedly increases xenophilies in lamina propria, and the duodenum showed flattening of the villi, dense is xenophilic infiltrate of lamina propria, which uh, was in keeping with allergy. Uh, showing other imaging from histology, the preliminary report, we can see here there's um, variable villus abnormality with shortening of the villi. And also we can see here the eosinophils in lamina prop, they are increased in number. And also there is uh, this uh, hypervicularization of surface of enterocytes. So here, this can be uh, due to cell damage, but also we, sh we should think of uh, microvallus inclusion disease. But this is something that we, it's uh, the histology report, um, they say they would take a, a better look at it and then we they can say if this is more likely to cell damage or there is something else. So um, the baby, uh, uh, we changed the, the, we changed the formula and uh, for almost two weeks, um, he continued with the, with the, with the diarrhea, it was uh, still dehydrated and the weight was continuing to drop. So at that moment, we decided to um, insert a steteral venous catheter and to commence total parietal nutrition. But uh, the baby was not okay. He, was, uh, he had fever, he had a raised CRP. Uh, the CRP workup was uh, performed and we, then we started antibiotics. We started meropenem and then we delayed the, 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 um, the CVC. 
So then uh, we left the baby um, Nilperos temporarily and the stools improved. And then so we could, at that point, we couldn't start the TPN. We decided to start uh, the amino acid formula uh, while preparing for the TPN and see if he was going to respond to that or not. So after starting the amino acid formula, he, the diarrhea stopped. He was passing, uh, he's still passing one soft soap a day. He was starting to regain his weight. So yeah, then uh, has improved on the, on the amino acid formula. We decided to postpone the TPN. And uh, after starting the, the amino acid formula, we haven't uh, challenged the baby yet. So uh, this is just to show the um, uh, diagnostic approach, uh, the uh, diagnostic approach and management of cosmic uh, protein allergy in infants and children. This is the these are the ESPGAN uh, guidelines from 2012. So you can see here then uh, we have a patient. Uh, we assess the patient. We do the history, the physical examination, the laboratory tests. Uh, so if there is anaphylaxis or clear immediate type reaction, we think of uh, Ig mediated allergy, and we try to do an emulation of cow mix, uh, cow's milk protein and test for specific IgA. So if the specific IgA is positive, so we should treat uh, this patient as a, a cow's milk protein allergy, IgA mediated, and we should do an elimination diet. If the IgE specific is, is negative, so we should do a oral food, uh, oral food challenge with cow's milk protein. And then um, if it is positive, we should uh, go to um, an elimination diet. If it's negative, uh, there's no, uh, there's no cow's milk protein and there's no need to do a uh, cow's milk elimination diet. So if the, patient doesn't have uh, anaphylaxis or um, any signs of immediate, uh, immediate type reaction, uh, we can do a diagnostic elimination diet. So if the early and late reactions like vomiting ectopic eczema one to two weeks, we can uh, do an elimination diet for one to two weeks. And if there are uh, gastrointestinal symptoms like diarrhea, constipation, we can do the, 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 the elimination for two to four weeks. If uh, there is improvement of the above symptoms, uh, we, should, uh, do, we should do a standard, uh, oral food uh, challenge. If it is negative, then uh, we don't need to do a uh, false milk protein elimination diet. If it is positive, we have to uh, do an elimination diet. If, uh, there's no improvement of, of, of clinical symptoms with the elimination diet. So there's no reason to treat this patient as a cow's milk protein allergy. So this is, these are the, the guidelines. So what um, if you have a patient with cow, cow's milk protein allergy, you have to do uh, a strict abundance of cow's milk protein. The surface is the safest strategy for managing these patients. Uh, and most of the patients uh, respond well to extensive hydrolyzed formula. Uh, only um, only a small percent percentage will need amino acid formula. So the the risk is higher in infants with severe enteropathy or with multiple food allergies. And so also the problem is the cost of. Um, of the these special formulas, they extensively hydrolyze the amino acid formula. So it's not very easy to get these formulas. And even for our patient, uh, now he's on amino acid formula. Ideally, we would like to uh, send him home on amino acid formula and then bring him back after four weeks of exclusion diet to do a, a challenge. But uh, unfortunately, it's something that we cannot do. Probably we'll have to challenge him sooner than we wanted with the extensively hydrolyzed formula, uh, which is not ideal. Uh, but um, according to our resources, well, uh, that's uh, what we'll have to do. So going to talking about a little bit of the non-IgE mediated gastrointestinal food allergy. Uh, 
The term food allergy is used to designate an immune-mediated adverse reaction to, reaction to food proteins. So uh, food allergies can be categorized by the pathophysiology into IgE-mediated, the ones that we have anaphylaxis uh, or, um, or um, immediate reactions. The patient, uh, if he is exposed to the offending food, after one to two hours, you will start having symptoms and you have uh, like symptoms of anaphylaxis um, uh, after ingestion of the offending food. And also, we can classificate uh, the food allergies in non IgE mediated. Um, that uh, usually the, the, the symptoms starts after, they can start after days after the uh, after ingestion of the offending food. So, and usually we don't have uh, um, anaphylaxis symptoms. We don't have rash, we don't have angioedema. Uh, usually we don't, we don't have um, uh, respiratory symptoms. And then uh, we have also the mixed. We have uh, IgE-mediated and non-IgE-mediated symptoms. And also, which is the, the our talk today, the non-IgE-mediated gastrointestinal food allergies that also are not uh, IgE-mediated. So in the first years of life, food allergies represent a substantial proportion of disorders involved in the GI tract. So it's very important for us, for gastroenterologists, to think of, of, of these uh, food allergies and try to make a, a diagnosis as soon as possible. So going to the classification, um, the food, we can uh, classify actually in um, this three big entities. We can classify in food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome. We can uh, also classify in food protein induced allergic protocolitis. We can classify in food uh, protein induced enteropathy. Also, sometimes they in include also isonophilic uh, gastrointestinal diseases or celiac disease, but mostly are the the these three, uh, the, the, the FIs, the FP, uh, FPAP and uh, the FPE. So the food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome is a non IgE mediated gastrointestinal food depressivity that affects the entire gastrointestinal tract. And then we have the uh, food protein induced allerg allergic protocolitis that is a non IgE mediated as well. It's self limited and uh, it's a food allergy that affects the rectum and the colon and the colon. Sorry, food. And then we have the fruit protein induced enteropathy, uh, that is a non IgE mediated food allergy that usually affects the small bowel, which uh, leads to malabsorption and can lead, and lead, can lead to failure to thrive. So uh, talking about the clin clinical manifestations, uh, usually patients with FPIs, um, they start having symptoms within the first three to six months of age when they are exposed to cow's milk uh, protein and to soy. And also they can start having symptoms when they're in, uh, introduced uh, to solid foods around the four to seven months of age. Um, if uh, if uh, FPIs, we can, also, we can um, uh, classify FPIs in acute and uh, chronic. Usually when it's acute, it develops with intermittent or re-exposure after abundance. Uh, and if it's chronic, usually it's a patient that is, uh, is chronically um, uh, exposed to the failing food. So uh, normally the patient will have a severe projectile and repetitive emesis starting within one to three hours after ingestion. Uh, the patient can present with pale or lethargy with or without diarrhea and hypotension. These patients usually come in metabolic acidosis, hypernatremia, they require um, IV fluids, they have to go to the emergency the department. And then, uh, like I was saying, we have the chronic with the regular intake. Uh, they can have intermittent symptoms uh, with progressive emesis, diarrhea, and usually they progress to failure to try because with this ongoing vomiting emesis, um, they don't grow up uh, like they should. Then we have the food protein induced allergic proctocolitis, which usually starts in the first six months of life. Uh, and this uh, food protein induced uh, uh, allergic proctocolitis, usually the baby looks well, it's growing well. Uh, he might present with broad streaks and mucus stools. Uh, it can have uh, insidious onset with a prolonged latent period of introduction of the food. 
So that means that after introduction of the food, the, ba the baby might not have symptoms. It might take a while to present with the symptoms. Sometimes uh, the patient uh, can um, present with increased gas, colic, pain on defecation, intermittent emesis, increased frequency of bowel movements, but this is not frequent. The most, uh, the, uh, the most frequent presentation is the baby that is well, only with blood stools. And usually these babies don't have failure to thrive and they, may, they, can, they can have anemia um, even, the, even when they are getting iron supplementation. And then we have the food, food protein induced enteropathy, uh, which, which usually starts in the first nine months of life. Uh, the patient presents with procreated diarrhea and uh, usually starts one to two months after the introduction of the food. The onset of symptoms is gradual and in, in other patients can mimic uh, acute gastroenteritis, transient emesis and anorexia. It's difficult to distinguish uh, food protein-induced enteropathy from post syndrome, and more than 50% of these patients have uh, failure to thrive, abdominal distension, early satiety, and malabsorption. Uh, so, uh, food protein-induced uh, um, induced uh, allergic protocolitis is uh, the most frequent one of these uh, three entities. So there, according, uh, there is no much data about, about the epidemiology, but there was a large study uh, of an Israeli birth court found that, that found that overall prevalence of PF to be relatively low at 0.16%. But there was another study that uh, found a, a, a higher incidence of 17%, a study that was done in healthy newborns um, in the USA. So there also was another Finnish study uh, that showed the prevalence of food protein enteropathy uh, in older children to be 2.2%. Uh, FPIs is considered rare, and um, in recent re reports, the, it revealed the cumulative incidence of 0.3 to 0.7 in infancy. So, although the, uh, these uh, these allergies uh, are non IgA mediated, there is association with uh, other topic diseases, and we can see uh, that in 40 to 60 percent of uh, FPI patients, and after to 40 to 50 percent of the patients with FPE and FPR patients. Uh, also, FPIs and FPE have been reported in patients with Down syndrome as well. So, uh, the mechanisms of um, non IgE uh, mediated gastrointestinal food allergies uh, is still not um, uh, well, uh, well, uh, well characterized. So for FPIs, there's, um, uh, there is involvement of food allergy and specific suppressor CD8 T cells. And also there is um, um, evidence of, of lo local production of food specific IgE antibodies, and there's no uh, systemic specific IgE. Uh, then um, uh, they think uh, that FPIs is T cell uh, mediated, and there is some evidence that uh, there is T cell proliferation on simulation with fault antigens, but there are not a lot of studies uh, to prove this. Also, it was found that, that, there, that there is an increase in intestinal interferon uh, gamma levels and um, that are associated with villous uh, injury. And also there is an imbalance between intestinal uh, to, um, tumor necrosis factor uh, alpha levels and decreased expression of uh, uh, tissue growth factor beta. So the T cell activation by the food allergens might mediate local intestinal inflammation. There is a release of pro-inflammatory cytokines and, and also there is increased intestinal permeability and food shift. So this is uh, uh, what has been postulated to that happens in FPIs, but that hasn't been uh, uh, fully proven. For the other entities, FPAP and FPA, there's really the, the, the mechanism hasn't been described. So going to the infending foods, um, FPIs, uh, the single most common uh, offending food is cow's milk uh, protein. 
Also, we have the soy, cereals like rice and oats, egg, vegetables, uh, fish, shellfish, and mushrooms. So, and most of the uh, uh, most of the patients, uh, FIS is going to be caused, caused by a single food, but it can be more than one food. We have patients with FIS that react to soy and also to cow's milk as well. Uh, five to ten percent are allergic to more than trade foods. In uh, FPAP, and infants is caused mainly by cow's milk and also soy, egg, corn, and wheat. In food protein induced enteropathy, uh, this can be caused by cow's milk, wheat, and egg. So uh, going to the breastfeeding, uh, usually infants with F bite and FPE are usually asymptomatic during breastfeeding. Uh, F bites are the food allergens transmitted through breast milk is rare, but it can happen. Uh, in some studies, symptoms are reported in approximately 10% uh, of 10 of the babies that are breastfed. Uh, breast milk IgE, uh, they think that uh, the reason why most of the patients in, uh, with FPIs that are breastfeeding don't have symptoms is uh, the presence of the IgA in the, in the breast milk that might play a protective role uh, by modulating the local gut mucus immune response and limiting the amount of antigen to, to, to the baby. And up to 60% of PAP develops during exclusive, uh, uh, um, not like in f develops during uh, exclusive breastfeeding. That means that even uh, during breastfeeding, they can still have symptoms and we have to pay attention to that because sometimes you think uh, it's breastfeeding, so probably it's not allergy, but it can be allergy, yes. So the diagnosis, it's not, uh, the diagnosis, I think it, uh, it relies on the history, the physical and determination. Uh, we need to have a detailed uh, history of the, um, of the diet and uh, if, we should get also that records uh, because there are no um, laboratory tests, there are no um, uh, markers, biomarkers that can tell us this patient has uh, allergy, this patient doesn't have. So it's really important to do a good history. So, and also we have to do the trial elimination diets and oral food challenges. This, this is how we, according to the guidelines, that's how we do the diagnosis of uh, these allergies. So biopsy, we can do endoscopy and biopsy for the confirmation of um, food protein enteropathy, but also to exclude uh, other causes of the diarrhea in the infants. And in FPIs and FPAP, FPAP uh, endoscopy and biopsy is not indicated. We don't need to do that to uh, get a diagnosis. So there are these laboratory tests that, um, that, like I was saying, there are no biomarkers for the non-IgE GI um, food allergies. Uh, Food-specific IgE antibody levels are negative in the majority of patients. Of course, it can be positive, but most of the times it's not. Um, so we can do it, but if it's negative, that doesn't mean that the patient doesn't have an allergy. So also the, we can find increased intestinal permeability and fecal isonophilus derived from neurotoxins that have been identified, that have been identified as a potential biomarker, but this is, uh, this is not done routinely and it hasn't been, it's not being used. I think it's something that we can uh, use in the future with more studies. And also uh, in FPIs, uh, if we do FBC, we can uh, see increased white blood counts with neutrophilia and isonophilia, thrombocytosis, metabolic acidosis, and metagobinemia. So all these are findings in laboratory tests that can help us with the diagnosis. Usually FPI uh, is associated with iron deficiency anemia and mild apobuminemia. And in food protein uh, enteropathy, of course, there is malabsorption. We'll have uh, hypoalbuminemia, anemia, and hypoproteinemia, and also all the findings uh, in keeping with malabsorption. And of course, we have to do the elimination diet uh, to see if the symptoms resolve uh, in the elimination diet. So there should be an improvement of the images and diarrhea within a few hours in acute FPIs and days if it is chronic FPIs. So um, 
For FPAP, there should be a resolution of stools within a few days or with the elimination diets. And for food protein in, uh, induced improperly, it would take more time because there is um, um, there is malabsorption and the, the gut needs more time to recover from that. So it might take uh, uh, more time and sometimes it might take several months to, to resolve. And the oral food challenge, uh, for patients with FPIs, um, there is a potential risk of severe reactions. So we want to do the oral food challenge in the hospital setting. We have to have everything prepared. If you have sudden reaction, we can uh, quickly um, uh, treat the baby. So it might not be necessary for the initial diagnosis when the symptoms are really typical and recurrent. And subsequent oral food channels are required to determine whether f is has resolved or not, if the baby can go back to, um, to a normal diet or not. Uh, there are these criteria for um, uh, by uh, adapt by power for positive oral food challenge. If uh, we start the challenge with the let's say cow's milk protein, uh, if the message uh, starts within one to three hours, if the diarrhea starts two to three hours, and there is an increased neutrophil count uh, from the baseline or there is a fecal frank or occult blood, fecal leukocytes, fecal eosinophil. So this is a positive oral food challenge. So this means this patient has really um, uh, F bites and we, we then we, have, we are confirming and this patient really needs to be on an elimination diet. diet. So FPAP and FPA can be performed at home uh, and the Documented within with a symptom study, but this this is at the discretion of the physician. It doesn't have always to be like this. Uh, and according to each patient, if that is possible, we can do it. But uh, if not, we can do it also uh, in the hospital setting. So endoscopy and biopsy in these patients uh, most of the time is not required. Of, uh, only if the patient has FPE uh, to rule out. Uh, we need to do it to confirm the diagnosis of FPE. Usually these patients will present with lymphonodular application in the duodenal bulb and colon with or without erosions that are characteristic from this, um, from this entity and increase in uh, intraepithelial lymphocytes in the absence of celiac disease. Uh, in the other patients, it's not really necessary. And FPAP and FPAs, we don't need to do endoscopy and biopsy. So uh, the differential diagnosis, as you can imagine, we can do with um, within the allergic uh, conditions, acute FPIs, chronic FPE and FPF infections. It can be viral, bacterial, uh, parasitic uh, gastroenteritis. Also other causes, gastrointestinal causes of diarrhea, like Hirschsprung disease, pyloric stenosis, if you have uh, persistent emesis. Even a uh, very early onset IBD for the infants, uh, cystic fibrosis, other like um, if we have blood disorders, we might think we have to think of NEC for um, very small babies. Also metabolic and brain bone metabolic errors of metabolism. So we have uh, a lot of the differential diagnosis. So it means that uh, Practically, we should try to um, exclude all these conditions. Uh, uh, and make sure there's none of this uh, diagnosis uh, so that we can securely say, and of, of course, do the oral food challenge so the, that we can say this baby has uh, allergy. Management, uh, of course, uh, the main thing is the elimination of the defending foods. Uh, we have to give nutritional support to avoid deficiencies. Uh, we need a emergency treatment plan for FPIs because usually they um, present in shock. We should delay the introduction of new foods that are recognized as risk for FPIs. Uh, some patients uh, have tolerance to heated milk and egg proteins. Uh, other infants, uh, they, um, they respond very well to intensively hydrolyzed formula, or when they don't respond, we can try amino acid formula. Uh, if the baby is breastfeeding, we don't need to stop the breastfeeding, but we have to, uh, to start a study, an extrusion diet for the mother. And usually goat milk or other animal milk should not be used because usually they react to this uh, uh, milks as well. 
And of course, if the we don't, um, if the patient uh, continues with, to, to deteriorate, besides all these measures, we should think of TPN, which at some point we wanted to start for our patients. So this is just a quick um, uh, empiric recommendation for dietary management uh, for babies from zero to six months, from six to 12 months and more than 12 months. So we can try to uh, avoid introduction of certain foods that are um, more likely to cause FIs. And um, uh, of course, uh, we can try to delay that uh, and introduce, introduce these foods at a at later, uh, later stage. You can see from zero to six months, we can avoid cow's milk, soy, uh, soy milk. And um, of course, for small infants, we always want to keep uh, the baby on breastfeeding. Just uh, uh, we have to put uh, a web to start the animation diet for the mother, and we have to supplement this mother as well with uh, vitamin D, with calcium, and um, of course this goes on on and on for the other babies. This is was just for show a little bit. So. Going back to our patients, uh, he's still on amino acid forma for now. Uh, he's passing, I think, a soft stool per day. So since starting the amino acid forma, there was no diarrhea, no vomiting, and he's uh, slowly gaining weight. Um, and to diagnose it, we should still perform a challenge. But after being with diarrhea for so long, um, for more, uh, he was with diarrhea for almost a month, uh, more than a month. So we are um, still uh, debating when we are going to do the, the challenge. Thank you. These are the references so, of uh, the presentation. Thank you so much, Yolanda. That was an excellent talk. Uh, I think most of us on the call will recognize this patient. We've got we've all got patients that fit exactly the story that you're giving us. And it, it um, it's a challenge because amino acid formulas are ludicrously expensive. Even if you're in the private sector, funders are not so keen to assist um, and, and extensively hydrolyzed formulas are not much better. So I think certainly in, in our hospital, we tend to try soy earlier than we probably should. Um, we know there's overlap, but it's you know a lot more accessible. Um, and, and the same with, with challenges and with with uh, extensively hydrolyzed formulas we're quite quick to move to those um i don't see any questions in the chat i want to invite anyone to to pose their questions unmute yourself and uh, and ask otherwise i was thinking about a few cases that we've had um where on endoscopy we do find a significant amount of eosinophils and to me it's almost like an a uh, kind of a spectrum of disease between eosinophilic gastroenteritis and the food protein induced enterocolitis. And um, yeah, so th that was one of my observations. I think, um, did you do a, a colonoscopy or a sigmoidoscopy on this chart? Uh, no, 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 we didn't do a colonoscopy. Okay. Yeah, it's quite sick. So, yeah. Okay, I see a hand, uh, Prof Goddard, go ahead. Uh, thanks for a great um, presentation. I just wanted to know why did you not consider going a minor acid while you were waiting for your TPN? Because it was quite a long period where you weren't responding to um, the hydrolyzed feeds. The baby was continually dehydrating diarrhea, losing weight. And then the child became septic. So you lose quite a lot of time on these little babies. Was there any reason you wouldn't have thought of amino acid to see that response before TPN? Uh, yes, what happened is that uh, the baby was on the extensive hydrolyzed formula uh, in the referring hospital, but uh, it was a different one from the, the, the one that we have here in Tiger Bank. So we... As soon as it was admitted to a ward, we changed the, 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 the formula to extensively um, to the one that we have in the ward. And uh, it didn't, it, well, it was on that and it was back on uh, breastfeeding as well. 
So what happened? We decided to stop the breastfeeding because uh, thinking of allergy, mom was not on, a, on an exclusion diet. So we decided to stop the breastfeeding. So when we stopped the breastfeeding, actually there was, uh, uh, I think, one to two days that it, it was uh, it was improving, not, not completely free of diarrhea, but it was improving, it was not vomiting. So it looked like it was going to respond to the to the extensive idolized formula that we started and also with the with, with uh, stopping the bre breastfeeding. So then uh, he started having more loose tools uh, a day and vomiting, that's when we uh, decided to, uh, we saw that he wasn't responding even to, uh, even though we stopped the breastfeeding, uh, that's when we decided to try the, the amino acid formula, thinking that uh, this might be allergy and this might be a baby that doesn't respond to extensively hydrolyzed formula. So that's when we started uh, and I think the plan uh, wasn't wasn't to go to what well, we didn't want to start TPN before starting uh, amino acid formula, which doesn't make sense. That's why we started. But the plan was if it's going to fail to amino acid, we're going to TPN. That was the plan. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Uh, any other questions from anyone? I think one of my it's more an observation than a than a question, but you know we still have quite a lot of excessive diarrheal deaths in South Africa or Southern Africa, and I'm wondering sometimes whether the underlying causes like this that we, that we're completely missing we probably are. Um, certainly, to me, it seems like we're diagnosing more than we used to. That might be just um, increased awareness, I guess. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, a challenge for the time ahead in how we how we approach these kids, how we differentiate between um, post-infectious enteropathy, like you said, and and carbohydrate malabsorption and and these true allergies. Um, I'm just giving another second for anyone who's got any questions left or any comments. I don't see that. There is a, a link in the chat to leave your feedback. And with that, I want to just thank uh, Yolanda and her supervisor, Dr. Rose, very much for this excellent presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you to ECHO New Mexico and the ECHO India team who are the technical gurus. Um, the recording will be available on the Gastro website. So thank you to the Gastro Foundation and the sponsors. Next week, we will go back to histology or pathology with uh, Prof. Hale and, um, and Dr. Bobat. I see, can't see who the last one is, but I look forward to it. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, presenters. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you.